This is the word of the Lord from Psalm 40, beginning with verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Then we go to the last book of uh, the Bible, uh, Revelation um, 14 and Revelation 21. So the word of the Lord from Revelation chapter 14, beginning with verse 1. The vision of John, the Apostle John. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. And then our last reading is from Revelation chapter 21, and I will read the first five verses. The word of the Lord. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Thus far the reading of God's most holy and inerrant word. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Dear congregation of Christ, uh, did you know that none of you will be going to heaven? That is, according to Jehovah's Witnesses. Only the most devoted 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses will be in heaven. The rest of them, the rest of the Jehovah's Witnesses, will be spending eternity where? Only on earth. But only those who will qualify by diligently witnessing to their families and communities, knocking on the doors of the houses. Our readings in Revelation are the only text in the scripture that mentions uh, mention the 144,000. And who are these 144,000? Uh, Christians have wrestled with this question since the early church. Some say these are the Jews who will be converted in the end times. Or they are the Old Testament saints, a literal interpretation of the 12,000 people from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, making 144,000. So these two interpretations are the most common among evangelicals. However, there are several reasons why the 144,000 are not the end-time Jewish Christians 
or Old Testament saints. So first, if all the worshippers of Satan are sealed with the mark of the beast on their forehead or on their uh, arm, on their hand, um, then all of God's worshippers must also be sealed with a mark on their foreheads. Second, the 144,000 are called the servants of God. And all true Christians are often called servants of God in the book of Revelation. Third, the 144,000 are also those who have been redeemed from the earth and redeemed from mankind. And who are the redeemed from the earth and redeemed from mankind? All true Christians are those who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ and forgiven of their sins. Lastly, the book of Revelation is a book of symbols. And so most of the numbers are symbolic. For example, the number seven is symbolic of God's perfection, completion. In our text, 144,000 is made up of two, two symbolic numbers, 12 by 12 and 1,000. In, uh, so 12 by 12 for the 12 tribes of the Old Testament, Israel, and the 12 apostles in the New Testament. And 1,000 is symbolic of a great multitude of something, such as angels or people or even locusts in the book of Revelation. So we see the same symbolism in the description of the new heaven and new earth. The holy city has 12 gates, but inscribed with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the holy city has 12 foundations inscribed with the names of the 12 apostles. So multiplying 12 by 12 by 1,000 gives us 144,000. And therefore, the 144,000 represents a multitude of peoples from all nations, tribes, and languages redeemed during all of biblical history from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Every new year, we have hopes of a better or at least the same as the last. A few days ago, a Rasmussen Reports survey found out that half, about half of Americans believe their finances got worse in 2021. And only about one-third expect improvement in this year, 2022. Throughout 2021, Americans have become pessimistic. But as Christians, as we enter the new year, 2022, with the knowledge that uh, we are one year closer to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when he returns, we know that he will make all things new. In fact, we do not have to wait for his second coming to receive these new things, because the down payments of these new things have already been given to us. And so today our theme is Jesus' words, I am making all things new under four headings, and I will refer you to our sermon notes. So the first thing that God is making new that the Apostle John saw was a vision of the Lamb and the 144,000 standing on Mount Zion. And since the 144,000 represents the church, in other words, all true Christians, these are God's people. All those who hear the gospel of Christ, believe in him as God and Savior, and repent of their sins, are welcomed into the kingdom of God. They become members of God's family, God's household. And since Christ is the Son of God, all believers are his brothers and sisters. All who were formerly unrepentant unbelievers used to be excluded from the people of God. The Apostle Peter affirms this when he quotes God giving names to his Old 
covenant people, Israel. So in 1 Peter 2.9, he quotes from Exodus 19.6, these words, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. When he inaugurated Israel as the kingdom, as his kingdom on earth in Mount Zion, God called Israelites his chosen nation, his treasured people. But when Christ first came into the world, he inaugurated a new kingdom on earth. Peter continues in 1 Peter 2.10, Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And who was Peter addressing? It was both Jews and Gentiles, all who believe Christ from all nations, tribes, and languages of the world. If all true believers in the Old Covenant were the people of God before Christ came, then all true believers in the New Covenant are the new people of God. Paul explains that once Gentiles like us were aliens and strangers from Israel without hope and without God. But when you repent of your sins and believe in Christ as your Savior, Peter says in Ephesians 2.19, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So you and I have all the rights and privileges of being citizens of God's kingdom. We are already enjoying these rights and privileges. Our souls are nourished by God's word and by the body and blood of Christ. We have fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ in our church and in the church worldwide. We have the Spirit of God indwelling our souls to teach, guide, and strengthen us. And we have the guarantee of a heavenly inheritance, the new heaven and new earth. In God's future eternal kingdom, He will dwell with us forever because we are God's chosen, treasured people. The second new thing that the Apostle Paul saw in Revelation 14 is a new name for the 144,000. So what is this new name? The name of Christ, the Lamb, and His Father's name are written on their foreheads. In Revelation 7, all true believers who are called servants of God are sealed with the seal of the living God on their foreheads. In the ancient and medieval world, kings would have their official seal on their signet ring. So the king would seal all documents that he has written or approved to attest that he is the owner of these documents. In the same way, the seal of God and of Christ the Lamb attest to their ownership of the servants of God, their treasured possession. This seal guarantees that true believers are sealed with the Holy Spirit from Ephesians 1. The seal of God and of Christ on believers' forehead is a stark contrast to the mark of the beast on the foreheads of all unrepentant people who follow Satan. So people of God, you have a new name. In Revelation 2.17 and 3.12, those who hold fast the name of Christ and do not deny their faith in him will receive a new name. What is this new name? It is the name of God and of the Lamb and of the holy city of God. So imagine your own driver's license required for almost every legal transaction, except to vote, of course. What information is in it? The most important are your name, address, date of birth, and license number. Your driver's license 
tells anyone who reads it who you are, where you're from, or whether you are, that you are a legal uh, resident or citizen of a state. If your st status is not legal, or if you have repeatedly committed DUI or overspeeding, your license will be revoked, torn. It's as if you have become an illegal alien, and it is a shameful status. In the same way, as true believers, you carry the name of God and of Christ as your identification. This is why you do not want to have those bumper stickers that says, Christian on board, or honk if you love Jesus, or got Jesus. Because when you get pulled over or cut someone off, you are announcing to the world that you, who claim to be a Christian, did an unchristian driving maneuver. And when you do, the other drivers will not have anything good to say about you and worse about God and Christ. In contrast, we hear of all those Christians in the Middle East and Africa and Asia who refuse to recant their faith on pain of deprivation, torture, burnt houses, and churches, and even martyrdom. All of us, even unbelievers around the world, are in awe of the strength of their faith in Christ. May the good fruits of our faith in Christ demonstrate to all around us that we carry the holy name of God and of Jesus, our Savior. The third thing that God is making new is a new song. Uh, I browsed uh, some websites that promote new worship songs, and I stumbled on one that says, and, it, and I quote, Leaders and pastors, discover new songs that will encourage your church to engage and respond to the truth of the gospel. End of quote. And one of the new songs goes like this. Uh, verse 2. Fix my attention on your good intentions. I don't need blessings, for you are my heaven. God, I am desperate. Here I surrender. You are the blessing. And then the chorus, repeated umpteen times, says, All I ever need is you. All I ever need is you, God. Bring me back to this simple truth. All I ever need is you is you, God. So if we sang this song this morning, what would you have learned about God and Jesus and the Bible that is not trite and trivial? Absolutely nothing. Even pagans can sing that song about their own gods. You might also have noticed the emphasis on I, me, and my and on feelings, engaging the heart, but not the mind. But this, contemporary worship promoters would say, doesn't the Bible command us to sing a new song? For example, uh, we read in Psalm 40, verse 3, and Revelation 14, 3, these verses say it. That settles it, they would say. But not so fast, my dear friends. What does the Bible mean when it says that true believers sing a new song? The people of God singing a new song is found in several verses in the Bible. Psalm 33, 3, 43, 96, 1, 98, 1, 144, 9, 149, 1, Isaiah 42, 10, and Revelation 5, 9, 14, 3. Um, some of this we read. So let us look at each of these verses. Psalm 33.3 is a new song praising God for his might in creation, his righteousness and justice, his sovereignty over all things, and his deliverance of all his people. In Psalm 40 verse 3, David sings a new song to praise 
and give thanks to God for saving him from his enemies. The glad news of deliverance. Psalms 96.1 and 98.1 are new songs celebrating salvation in the Lord, his reign over all the nations, and his righteous and impartial judgments. Lastly, Psalms 144.9 and 149.1 and Isaiah 42.10 are new songs of victory in battle over the enemies of God's people. Therefore, when scriptures command us to sing a new song, it does not mean that we are to write a new song every 15 minutes. And this is what we often see in most churches today. The worship leader teaches a new song every Sunday. So in about a month or so, these new songs are old and boring and forgotten in place of new, new songs. Rather, a new song in the Bible is a song praising God for intervening in the life of his people. Salvation after condemnation, comfort and peace in place of mourning and despair, blessing instead of cursing, and victory over sin and death instead of God's eternal wrath. So a new song gives thanks to God for a new and blessed situation in the life of a believer. New life and new hope in Christ. This is why we read in Revelation 14, 3, no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Why? Because only true believers in Christ could learn and sing these songs. Because unbelievers reject God as the mighty and sovereign creator, as the ruler of the universe, and the gracious and merciful redeemer. They will have nothing to do with our God. And finally, God is making all things new. A new people of God, a new name for his people, and a new song to sing. Lastly, God is making a new creation, a new creature in Christ, and a new heaven and new earth. All true believers are new creatures, as Paul declares in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation or new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. God makes us a new creation only through faith in Christ alone. We are new creatures only because he bore all our sins on the cross. And as new creatures, God has given us the perfect righteousness of Christ. On judgment day, before God's throne of grace, he will declare us perfectly righteous because he sees in us the perfect righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ was resurrected from the dead in order that we too might walk in newness of life. As true believers, you are called by God to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. He, only comm he also commands us to put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. In other words, as new creatures in Christ, we are to live righteous and holy lives in the knowledge of of our Creator. However, since we still have not been freed from our sinful nature, we are called by God to strive to live renewed lives of righteousness and holiness. We are called to conform more and more to the image of our Creator and Savior to the end of our days. But until then, we are still sinners and saints at the same time, that is, until the end of our lives, or 
until Jesus, our Savior, returns to God, uh, gather us to the new heaven and new earth, whichever comes first. Afterwards, we read of our eternal blessedness. Dear brothers and sisters, in Revelation 14, 4 and 5, we read of, we read of the description of God's heavenly army. His army is pure and undefiled by sin. They obey the commands of Christ, their warrior lamb, who redeemed them from the tyranny of the devil. They are the first fruits of God's harvest out of the whole human race. They are blameless in speech, deed, and thought. They had put off the old self with its corrupt and deceitful desires, falsehood, and corrupting talk, stealing, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and malice. And in Revelation 21, we read of all true believers dwelling in the new heaven and new earth with God. The new heaven and new earth will be one entity because God himself will dwell with his people in this new creation. He will not be in heaven and uh, us on earth, but he will be with us in the new heaven, which is also the new earth. His new creation will be a perfect restoration of the earth when it will be set free from its bondage to corruption. It will be a new eternal paradise, a new garden of Eden, where Satan will never be able to enter in because they will be cast in hell. He will be cast in hell together with all his followers. But not only the earth will be set free from the corruption of sin. All of God's people will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Romans 8. <clears throat> this is our blessed hope in 2022 and always. The sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. In that eternal new creation, there will be no more tears, death, mourning, crying, or pain anymore because God has made all things new. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty and most gracious God, we, as we open the year, with this Lord's Day, we thank you for all your tender mercies upon us during the whole course of our lives, and especially during the past year. <clears throat> Accept our thanksgiving for all your blessings. Fill our hearts with humility and love, with gratitude and trust. We praise you for making us your new people, giving us the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, making us sing a new song and promising us a new heaven and new earth for eternity. <clears throat> for all these blessings, we offer to you the sacrifices of our praise and we acknowledge that through your great goodness and help, we are enabled to live our lives in peace and with righteousness. Through Christ our Lord, amen.